It is good to be with you again tonight. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, please let me know by using the contact information on the screen. If you're joining us on the phone, my number is 608-224-0274, and I would love to hear from you. We have good news tonight that Brandy's surgery went well yesterday, so we pray for her as she recovers. And then also we need to be remembering Jerry Turley in our prayers. Jerry is not doing well today, and so let's be praying for Jerry. And also that uh, Karen would have strength as well as she encourages him and cares for him through this. Uh, please also remember that we are continuing to have two worship services every Lord's Day to keep us under the 25% capacity in our building. That gives us plenty of room to spread out safely. And so please be sure to sign up for one of those two services every Sunday morning. I uh, hate to do it, but this is a, a weekly thing for us now to do the sign up. And uh, just I need to look at that again to double check the, the procedure for that. But I think there's kind of a two-step process where you click to sign up and then you have to scroll down just a little bit to say OK or something like that. So let's look at that again and make sure that we get signed up. That helps us take attendance. It also helps us to have a record in case any of us get sick during the week. We know who to contact, and so it helps us in that regard. So if you have any questions about that, if you need any help signing up, please get, uh, contact either me or Kenna, and we'd be glad to walk you through that. Our plan, again, is to continue our class online and on the phone every Wednesday, so we will not be at the building on Wednesdays, and then continue online on the phone and at the building every Sunday, just as we have been doing. Let me know if you have any questions or concerns, and please sign up online. We had a good suggestion from one of our members just yesterday concerning the procedure for Sunday morning, and so we'll make sure to make a little bit of a tweak this Sunday, and that is announcing the song beforehand, maybe even before the Bible lesson, so that those of you joining on the phone only are able to look that up on your own and follow along with us in a songbook at home to give you a little... A heads up or advance notice on the song. So we'll try to incorporate that this coming Sunday as a little bit of an improvement. I have a special request for those of you who are joining us by listening in on the phone tonight. I'd like to have a series of lessons based on requests from our phone audience. And so if you do not have internet, if you do not have a smartphone, if you're not watching online, but if you are listening by calling in to that phone number, I would invite you to be thinking of what you would like to hear in sermon form. So any questions about the Bible, a favorite passage that we haven't studied for a while, maybe a topic or a fav favorite Bible character, I might send out postcards or something in the near future if I don't hear from you. I think there are about 10 to 12 people who only join us on the phone so I want to pay special attentions to that group for the next several weeks, if at all possible. So if I don't hear from you, I may get in touch with you, but feel free to drop me a line uh, in the mail, old-fashioned snail mail, and uh, either that or give me a call. If you have any ideas for a sermon, I would love to hear from you. I would really appreciate that. Again, my number is 608-224-0274. Tonight, we get back to our study of the book of Luke. And we won't be relying on it too much tonight, but in our class, I just want to remind you, I will occasionally refer to A Harmony of the Gospels by Robert Thomas and Stanley Gundry. It's available online for about 25 bucks, so that information is on the screen. By way of review, we know Luke is a Gentile. He is a medical doctor. Later, Paul will refer to Luke as the beloved physician. And Luke researches his gospel account. He interviews eyewitnesses. He makes a point of writing in chronological order. And he also includes a number of people who are often overlooked and sometimes oppressed in the ancient world. So women, widows, Gentiles, Samaritans, and various forms of uh, those who suffered with various forms of illness. Last week, you may remember, we looked at the healing of a demon-possessed man who was unable to speak. We looked at what Jesus had to say about some of those in the crowd demanding a sign, and then we had Jesus eating with the Pharisee, and this Pharisee was surprised that Jesus doesn't wash himself ceremonially before eating, and at that point, Jesus goes into an extended discourse on the shortcomings of the Pharisees. Primarily, they were concerned about the outward appearance without really being concerned with what was going on in the heart, and so Jesus came down pretty hard on that. Tonight we pick up with Luke chapter 12. We hope to make it halfway through this chapter tonight, continue next week with the last half of chapter 12. 
And we're about to find in the opening verses of Luke 12 that Jesus' harsh words toward the Pharisees do not scare off the crowds. In fact, if anything, more people are attracted to this, and so more people join in. And, and so the opposite is true. This is when people really start showing up. So tonight, let's look together at Luke chapter 12, and the first passage is Luke 12, verses 1 through 7. Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. Under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, he began saying to his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetops. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear you are more valuable than many sparrows. At the beginning here, we find the crowds are so huge that people are literally stepping on top of each other. And in the middle of these huge crowds, Jesus starts talking not to everybody, but notice in this passage, he is speaking to his disciples or to his followers in particular. So everybody can hear these words, but he is speaking to his disciples. And notice he's warning them about the leaven of the Pharisees. And we just finished studying the Pharisees in the previous chapter, and so this is a familiar theme. You may remember that we studied leaven in sermon form a couple months ago, and we learned that leaven is usually used as a negative illustration in Scripture, as it is here. But sometimes it's positive. In that passage that we studied a few months ago, the growth of the kingdom in that passage back in Matthew, it is compared to the growth of leaven in a lump of dough. So there it was good. But here the reference is negative as he warns his disciples to beware, that is to be cautious of, the leaven of the Pharisees. Leaven, of course, is known for spreading. It's known for growing. In bread, leaven is generally good. Leaven transforms Leaven causes the bread to rise, and so it changes the shape. It, it changes the nature of the dough. Leaven brings flavor and so on. There are many good things we could say about leaven. But in this comparison, it's bad in that, yes, it spreads. And what spreads is hypocrisy. And so he's making a comparison. Hypocrisy, the word hypocrisy, goes back to a Greek word that often referred to pretending. It referred to actors on a stage. They are pretending. They're playing a role. And sometimes pretending is good. We appreciate good actors. However, when it comes to our faith, obviously pretending is bad. It's really bad because God can see through it and others can see through it as well. And that's what Jesus is warning about here. Don't be pretending. Don't be pretending like the Pharisees are doing. Remember, as we learned last week, they are concerned about the outside of the cup and the way it looks on the outside, but they are not concerned about the inside. Of course, that's the opposite of the way it needs to be. Ideally, we really want the inside and the outside to be clean, don't we? But when the outside is clean, we might make the mistake of assuming that the inside is clean. That's a mistake we really don't want to be making. Several weeks ago, I was thinking back to something that happened to me back in middle school down in Crystal Lake, Illinois. I got some kind of English muffin for lunch at the cafeteria down there. It had something baked on top. It was like an English muffin pizza or ham and cheese, something that was baked or melted on the top of the English muffin, something like that. I don't remember. But I do remember eating half of that muffin and then turning it over for some reason. And on the bottom of that English muffin was a huge spot of mold. And it was thick and it was big, almost the whole bottom of that muffin, or maybe more accurately, I should say, 
half of a huge spot of green mold because I had eaten the other half of that English muffin. And I guess I think about that and what Jesus says here. Just because something looks good on the surface doesn't mean that it actually is good. We know very well from experience, many of us do, that looks can be deceiving. And so from that day forward, back in middle school, I always check the bottom of every English muffin I ever eat. And so if I come to your house someday and you serve me an English muffin, <laughs> please do not be offended when I turn it over. It changed me. <laughs> All right? I always look at the bottom of every English muffin. Uh, but we understand what Jesus is warning about here, and that is hypocrisy, trying to make ourselves look good to others on the outside when we're really not concerned about what's going on on the inside. In our hearts, then, uh, Jesus is warning his disciples about this. He wants them to beware. He wants them to be careful about the hypocrisy or the leaven of the Pharisees. And notice he goes on to explain the reason for this caution. There's a time coming when everything hidden will be made known. And there's a time coming when everything covered will be revealed or uncovered. Whatever we've said in private will be heard publicly. Whatever we've whispered in the closet will be shouted from the housetops. And so it seems then that Jesus' warning to the disciples is, be genuine, be real, be good, not just on the surface, but all the way through. Just because we think we can get away with some sinful thought or some private sinful action doesn't mean that we will get away with it. In fact, what we've done or thought might get, be, uh, might get made uh, very public. At first, verse 4 doesn't really make much sense as coming after verse 3, at least to me in my mind. But it seems to me maybe the key here is fear. Why do we often try to keep things private? Why are we tempted to be hypocrites? What's the root cause of that? I think often it's because we're scared. Maybe we're scared of how people might treat us if they knew who we really are. If I let myself be known to this person as I really am, maybe they won't accept me, they won't like me, they'll think differently about me or whatever. And so we're tempted to try to project an image on the outside that may be different than what we really are. And since this is the way it often happens, Jesus says, starting in verse 4, that we really shouldn't fear those who are able to kill the body. And after that, can't do anything. But instead, we really need to fear the one who is able to cast us into hell. Yes, I tell you, Jesus says, fear him. And so as I understand this, we are to fear God. When I went to Fried Hardeman University down in Tennessee for the very first time, I jumped in. I mean, straight from a public high school in the Chicago area, right to a Christian university. And as many of you know by now, if you know me, it happened in one weekend. I graduated in January. And so I graduated from high school on a Friday. I went into the principal's office. I shook his hand and I, and I left. And that, that was my high school graduation. I packed on a Saturday. I drove to Tennessee all day on Sunday, registered on Monday as I remember it. And I started college classes on Tuesday. And, and in my first class with Ralph Gilmore, who was a professor in the Bible department, he gave a test. And it was several weeks into the semester, and it, it was a room full of students. I think the class was Scheme of Redemption. It was a, a very good class. And I still remember him telling this room of 40, 50 students. He said, as he passed out these test papers, be sure to keep your eyes on your own paper. One test isn't worth going to hell over. You know, I never... Uh, Never had a teacher say that to me in the in the high school that I went to. That really wasn't a concern, and you know I think uh, he knew he, who he was talking to, and and I think that may be what Jesus is saying here. There are worse things in life than failing a test. There are worse things in life than death, if that makes sense in this passage. And some of our choices that we make in this life have eternal consequences. And so when fear motivates our decision-making process here in this life, let's make sure we're afraid of what we really need to be afraid of. There are more serious things going on than what we might see on the surface. And speaking of God, the last two verses here basically tell us not to fear. Yes, if we sin, we do need to fear God. But if we think of God as our Father, 
this fear has a way of melting into respect because he cares for us. He loves us. He wants what's best for us. The reference here to sparrows. Sparrows are cheap and are pretty much insignificant in the big scheme of things. Not many people really pay much attention to sparrows on a daily basis. But this passage says God cares even for the sparrows. And if he cares for the sparrows, then he also cares for us. Even the hairs of our head are numbered. I don't know whether this is literal or figurative, but who cares, right? Either way, isn't the lesson basically the same? God cares for us. He knows us. He loves us. He sees what we're going through. We are more valuable to him than sparrows. Let's move on tonight to Luke 12, verses 8 through 12. Luke chapter 12, verses 8 through 12. And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. In verses 8 and 9, we have something of a deal, as I see it. It is something of an agreement between Jesus and his followers. If we admit to knowing if we admit to following Jesus here in this life, he says that he'll speak up for us in the life to come. On the other hand, the opposite is also true. If we deny him now, he will deny us later. And based on what comes in verse 11, it seems the context here might be persecution of some kind. We think about Peter. Remember, he only denied knowing Jesus when he was scared, when he was afraid, correct? When there was some pressure put on him. In the same way today, we usually don't are not tempted to deny Jesus for no reason. We just don't walk around saying we don't know him. But it's when pressure comes, when there's a reason not to, we might say. And so this is an issue when we think we have a reason for denying Jesus, when we're getting persecuted or, or pressured in some way. And so the reminder from Jesus is he will admit knowing us if we'll admit knowing him. To confess is to speak the same thing as and so when we confess Jesus, we are agreeing with him. We are speaking the same thing as he is speaking. We are agreeing with who he claims to be, the Son of God. That's what a confession is. We are speaking the same thing. Notice he transitions in verse 10 to actively speaking against either the Son of Man, that is Jesus, or the Holy Spirit. Speaking against Jesus can be forgiven. But blaspheming or speaking against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. You might remember in an earlier exchange over in Matthew and Mark, the sin against the Spirit is tied to people who accuse Jesus of casting out demons by the ruler of the demons. And so they were attributing Jesus' power to Satan. And so if you're saying that the work of the Spirit is really the work of Satan, Jesus seems to be saying you will never turn back from that. If you go that far, that, that is a one-way trip to, discuss, uh, to destruction. One author on this subject said, Once you declare that the spring of fresh water is in fact polluted, you will never drink from it. And that makes sense to me here, especially with regard to the Spirit. And remember, he's going to go on to say that the Spirit will give them the words that they need to say. And so as I say, see it, if we reject those spirit-given words given through the apostles and the authors of Scripture, like we are now reading tonight, if we reject those words, there's nothing else coming. Scripture is God's last word to the human race. And so if we turn away from Scripture, if we deny the Spirit, if we turn away from the Spirit in that regard, we've committed the unforgivable sin. There's no coming back from that. One author has pointed out, though, many people have, if you're worried whether you've committed the sin that is not forgivable, your concern is probably proof that you have not yet committed the unforgivable sin. If you still have a soft part, a soft spot in your heart for Scripture, 
If you're still worried about the words of Jesus, then there is hope yet for you, and you could turn your life around tonight. On the other hand, if you don't care about Scripture, if you reject the Holy Spirit of God as revealed in Scripture, the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit uh, is the Word of God. If we reject that Word, uh, there's nothing else coming. Notice then at the end in verses 11 and 12, we get back to persecution being brought up on charges for preaching. Basically, Jesus lets his disciples know that they are not to worry about what they will say because the Spirit will tell them what to say. Again, he's talking here about miraculous inspiration. Sometimes I refer to this as a direct hotline to God where the apostles and those early preachers who had the miraculous gifts, God was communicating to them directly. And so they would perform miraculous signs as proof that what they said was true. Of course, we don't have this direct communication from God today in a miraculous sense. Instead, we have the written word. But they didn't have the written word yet back then. And so the Spirit would intervene by telling them what to say. Uh, today, thankfully, we can quote book, chapter, and verse. And so if we want to know what God says on a subject, we can look it up and we can share that. With all of this wise teaching, I want us to notice next, somebody from the crowd steps up with a special request. And that brings us to Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? so is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. First of all, it's interesting to me that somebody sees Jesus as an authority figure of some kind. We know that the crowd saw him as teaching with authority. We have the, the verses right there at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that, that show us that. But here, somebody sees him not just as, a, as an authoritative teacher, but they, they see him almost as a judge as an arbitrator, as a settler of disputes. This, by the way, is how people looked at Moses. If you remember, Moses was basically a judge for a period of time. If you remember back in the book of Exodus, uh, everybody was bringing their cases to Moses. And, and all day long, from sunup to sundown, he was dealing with issues. He was dealing with drama. And this is what led to Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, telling him he needed to delegate some of that responsibility, which he does. But we know that Jesus is the prophet like Moses. There was that prophecy that said God would raise up a prophet like Moses from among the people. That's Jesus. And we see it here. We see Moses in Jesus. This man apparently thinks not only that Jesus would take his side, but he seems to think that his brother would accept the ruling, which I find interesting as well. And so they come to Jesus as an authority figure, as something of a judge. And it is a dispute over the family inheritance. And like many of you, I've, I've seen some absolutely terrible things happen to families after somebody passes away. Arguments about the inheritance, arguments about money, arguments about stuff. You know, some picture hanging on the wall will tear people apart. Who gets this when mom and dad pass away? The arguments about rusted out old cars that have no earthly significance to anybody but a brother and a sister, and they'll, they'll fight out, they'll fight over it. 
Um, but, but stuff has a way of dividing people, and that seems to be the case here. According to Jewish tradition at that time, the oldest son would usually get double the inheritance of the other siblings. And so as you can imagine, it had a way of getting really complicated. Well, how do you do that? How do you value things, and how do you divide up the family estate? However, instead of whipping out a calculator, Jesus backs away from this one, doesn't he? He tosses the case. He's not going to rule on the case itself. And, and then he says something to them. Notice he does not seem to address this directly to the man with the issue. But this is for everybody, probably including the man. He's probably still there. This is a much larger lesson, though, that everybody needs to hear. And the lesson comes in the form of a warning about greed. And it seems that he gives the moral of the story before the actual story. And I appreciate that. He says, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And so to the guy who apparently just lost his parents and is mainly concerned about their stuff, Jesus basically says, it's not about the stuff. Even if you have plenty Life is not about the possessions. And to illustrate this, Jesus tells a parable. A parable is usually a short story with a double meaning. That there is the story itself, and then there is the parallel story. I think about a parable like two people bowling side by side. There are two lanes, and somebody bowls in one and somebody bowls in the other. Literally, the word parable comes to us from a word meaning to throw beside. And so there's one story in one lane, but there's another story in the other lane right beside it. And not all people will get the double meaning. To most people, oh wow, that's a great story. But to those who are more spiritually minded, they can see what the real lesson is. And so the story is about a rich man who's having an incredibly productive year on his farm. And since he's running out of room to put everything, he decides to tear down his barns to build larger barns. Well, I would ask, what could he have done? with all of that extra produce. Obviously, he could have shared it, correct? He could have been good. He could have shared it with the poor and, and so on. However, instead of doing that, he decides to tear down his barns and build larger barns. And whatever, what always impresses me in this parable is how many times this man refers to himself. And I think in some of my Bibles in the past, I've circled or underlined all the first person pronouns. Think about this. He says to himself, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store up all of my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. So notice, over and over again, this man is talking to himself about himself. He is a selfish man. What he doesn't know, however, is that this is it. He is to die this night. And so this is the story. The parallel part of the story comes at the very end. Sometimes Jesus explains his parable, sometimes he doesn't. He explains this one as he says, So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So the rich man in the story obviously should have included God in his plan somehow, but he doesn't. Not that it's a sin to ever build a larger barn. That's not the main point of this story. But the point here is the man is selfish, he's arrogant, and completely fails to plan for the life that's coming after this one. Can we make the same mistake today? Absolutely we can. Here in the United States of America, especially as wealthy as we are, absolutely we can fail to plan for the next life. And so as God's people today, uh, let's include God in our plans and let's share. Uh, many of us have had some unique opportunities due to the pandemic that we're in. Uh, providing food, helping people financially, helping in other ways. As we've often said, our goal is to be Jesus to the world around us. Be his hands, be his feet, do things for others as Jesus would have us to do. 
Uh, Jesus will continue to apply this parable in the next passage. So let's move on tonight to our last paragraph for tonight, Luke 12, 22 through 34. Luke 12, 22 through 34. And he said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life's span? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? And do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. But your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Notice this is now directed to, this, to, to the disciples. I love how he says little flock down near the end of this. He's in a huge crowd, so many thousands of people that they're stepping on each other. But Jesus is talking to his little flock, his followers within the larger group of so-called followers. So this is directed to the disciples. And Jesus is explaining what this means for them, this parable that he just told. They aren't the ones arguing about an inheritance, so it's not a direct application in that regard. But Jesus is bridging the gap from the parable to what they personally are dealing with. And notice he starts with food and clothing. These are basic necessities. Usually today, we don't worry about these things. We're not really concerned about food and clothing. We're worried about the car running or needing new carpet for the house. There's a different level of concern that Jesus is addressing here. These are the bare necessities. And I'm guessing that as these men are following Jesus all over Israel, this has been something of a concern. Remember, they've left fishing. They've left tax collecting. They've left their former lives behind, their former way of making a living. And now these men are following Jesus full time, we might say. And Jesus reminds them, don't worry. Life is more than food and clothing. Well, we might think that's easy for Jesus to say. And yet again, hasn't Jesus demonstrated this? He left the glory of heaven. He gave all of that up to come to this earth. And yet here he is. He apparently has food to eat, doesn't he? He apparently has clothing to wear. And so even with Jesus, who has given up so much, the basics are covered, and that's all we really need. And to illustrate, he invites them to look at the ravens. Unlike the rich farmer, the ravens neither sow nor reap. They don't work in that sense. They have no storeroom. They have no barns to store up their, their grain. And yet God feeds them, doesn't he? He takes care of the ravens. I don't know about you, but personally, I have never seen a skinny raven. Have you? Those are some huge birds. However, ravens, they get fed, don't they? And if God takes care of them, he'll also take care of us. You are more valuable to God than a raven. In verses 25 and 26, Jesus briefly moves to worry. It seems that money and worry are often tied together. We worry about money. Money causes us to worry. This is not a new thing. This goes back almost to the beginning, doesn't it? This has been a struggle for many, many years. And so he puts it in the form of a question. Which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his lifespan? Of course, we know today that worry not only will not lengthen our lives, 
But what will worry do to our lifespan? If we are worriers, worry will shorten our lives, won't it? And so if worry can't make us live any longer, then why do we think worry might solve our financial problems? Those things seem to go together. He then gets back to food and clothing by directing his disciples' attention to the lilies. As I see this in my mind, Jesus sees some lilies nearby. And so he uses a physical illustration and, and maybe he gestures, consider the lilies. And the illustration is, in all of his wealth, with all of his vast financial resources, even King Solomon never dressed like this. And the lesson is, if God can clothe grass in the field like this, we have absolutely no need whatsoever to worry about what we will wear. Stop worrying about what we eat, drink, and wear. The nations of the world eagerly search for these things. The world is all about money and food and clothing. But Jesus here says that we as God's people are different. We are kingdom people. Our kingdom is not of this world. Therefore, Jesus tells his disciples to sell their possessions and to give. And by giving to charity, we essentially make ourselves wallets that will never wear out. We are building up treasure in heaven. And this treasure will never be eaten by moths. It will never be stolen by thieves. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And this brings us to the end of tonight's study. There is a shift that happens at this point in Luke chapter 12. The first part of the chapter is primarily about stuff. And the rest of this chapter is about being ready. And so we hope to pick up next Wednesday, if the Lord wills, with Luke chapter 12, verse number 35. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Be sure to send me any prayer concerns so we can get those in the bulletin. And remember, if you're joining us on the phone, I would love to hear your sermon requests. What do we need to be studying in sermon form over the next few weeks? Drop something in the mail or give me a call at 608-224-0274. Next week, let's come prepared uh, one week from tonight on Wednesday uh, and come prepared for our next study by reading the rest of Luke chapter 12. Let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as being the God who provides for our needs. Whether food or clothing or shelter, you have truly gone above and beyond in every way in giving us what we need. We thank you for good food and clothing and for safe, warm, or cooled places to live. Thank you for caring for us. We're thankful that you have given us resources so that we can share with others not only what we need, but you've given us more than we need. We pray then that you would give us as your people opportunities as individuals and also as a congregation. Tonight we pray for pure hearts. You know who we are from the inside out. And so we pray that what people see on the outside would accurately reflect what is truly on the inside, that we love you and that we love the people around us. Let that be evident. We pray that our love would be both genuine and obvious as we reflect the light of your Son to a very dark world. We're thankful tonight that Brandy's surgery has gone well. We ask a special blessing on Jerry Turley as he struggles with his health right now. We also ask for strength for Karen as she helps comfort him and uh, as she helps, helps him along in his, in his struggles. Again, Father, we're thankful that you continue to supply all of our needs. We come to you with these requests, both thanking and praising you in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.